for the Tim Boyd, the international president of the Theosophical Society, fellow delegates and friends. A very good evening and a warm welcome to this evening's public lecture. The first public talk of the 143rd International Convention. It is a special privilege and honor for me to introduce my old friend, Professor P.C. Keshavan, the speaker of this evening. Dr. Keshavan and I were colleagues at the Baba Atomic Research Center of Bark, or Bark as it is called, a quarter century ago. At that time, he was the director of the biomedical group where I was associate director of the physics group. The topic of this afternoon's lecture pertains to Darwin's theory of evolution. As most of us are aware, the essence of Darwin's theory is that evolution of species occurs through random mutations followed by natural selection. In other words, all of us sitting in this auditorium, as also the birds and butterflies in the RDRS campus, are all the result of accidental mutations or in effect accidents of nature. What is surprising is that in spite of the remarkable progress in understanding the nature of the genetic code, such as the $5 billion human genome project of the 90s, the mainstream evolutionary biologists the world over are still clinging on to the natural, the random mutations narrative, proclaiming that we have understood how nature works and it is a done deal. To understand mutations and their role, who better to walk us through the puzzle than Professor Keshavan, since he is basically a geneticist and a radiobiologist. Professor Keshavan is currently Department of Atomic Energy's Homi Baba Professor at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation located in Taramani. He had, he had earlier been professor and dean of the School of Life Sciences at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and later, as I said earlier, director of the biomedical group at Bark in Mumbai. Subsequently, his mentor, Professor Swaminathan, brought him over to Chennai to serve as the executive director of MSSRF. Professor Keshavan is known internationally for his work on the modification of radiobiological effects by caffeine. He is a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Radiation Biology and also of the UK-based Journal of Radiological Protection. During 1995-98, Dr. Keshavan represented India at the United Nations Scientific Committee on Effects of Atomic Radiations at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. He has served as a visiting professor at the University of Manchester, the New University of Texas at Austin, USA, Justice Lieberg Unis Universität at Gießen in Germany, and the Strahlen Centrum of the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Doc Dr. Keshavan has published over 160 original papers in reputed national and international journals. He's a past president of the Environmental Mutagen Society of India and the Indian Society for Radiation Biology. He's presently a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, and the Institute of Physics in London. Professor Keshavan is currently involved in harnessing science and technology for human welfare and is, a work, and is working very closely with Professor Swaminathan in developing models and strategies to fight both famines of food and livelihoods in rural India. The topic of his lecture this evening 
is origin and evolution of species beyond Darwinism. I have great pleasure inviting Professor Chesan to deliver his talk. Thank you. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank President Tim Boyd for asking me to be here, and uh, Dr. Srinivasan, Dr. Srinivasan, uh, who, has been, who has been a good friend of mine for a quarter of a century, for having introduced me and also put the idea of the topic that I have to talk this evening on. As he said, I am a radiation biologist, but then he invoked the principle of every, no matter what your specialization in science is, there is a basic thread in every scientist, in every human being, whether he has or she has been through science or not. That is curiosity. What are we here? We are going to have a transition here, planet Earth. We are on that for a while, but then we have to go. How did we come? And we don't know when we are going to go. And then what happens when we have gone? The body is left behind, either cremated or buried. But then there is something else. What happens to it? Where is it? And so on. Somebody was talking to me about reincarnation. Is it true? The whole thing in my journey of about five decades in science, I've come across two categories of scientists. One category of scientists, those who think that they have solved all the problems of the planet and even of God, if they believed in. Then there is another kind of a, a group of scientists who believe that as they know something that was not known before, they also begin to unearth what remains to be unknown, what remains to be discovered. In fact, John Maddox, who was the editor of Nature, one of the prestigious science journals, once asked a question, what remains to be discovered? Then some answer was, the question is to find whether what we have discovered so far, are they correct? Or are we on a wrong path? And so on. This is a beautiful way. Now, all of us look around here, it's a beautiful thing that this auditorium, this temporary uh, place has been built, uh, constructed for this talk. Around you see the number of plants and so on, trees, shrubs, and also if you go into them, you'll find lots of fauna, lot kinds of animals, birds, insects, and so on. The question is, how did they all come about? Did they all come at simultaneously, there was a creation of insects on one hand, birds, the reptiles and mammals and so on, or they originated from one single point, starting point. And if it had begun with a starting point, how did we all see? How do we see so much of diversity? How did all these variations come about and so on? This is a curiosity that persisted in every human being, not only just this, uh, uh, in the contemporary times, but from times memorial. As you know, humans were all nomadics. They were hunters and gatherers of food until about 11,000 years ago. Then suddenly, they adopted cultivation and also domestication of animals. Incidentally, dog was the first animal the man became friendly with. And uh, he needed the wolves, in those days the wild dogs, to help him in hunting. And today, it is a sad thing that most of the people in and around this country do not care for dogs, our ancient friend of 40,000 years. Now, sometime about two centuries ago, a person called These three people, in their own way, have made human contributions to our understanding of how variations, how variations are important in bringing about diversity. The first one is Lamarck, the eldest of the whole three. And he thought that as you go around, there are environmental differences, and these differences impact on the organism, and so much so that that's progeny get the, the, the environmental impact inherited. In other words, he thought that uh, uh, the environmental circumstances, signals, etc., are transmitted and so on. But many people didn't accept it at the time. Then came Charles Darwin, 
who is um, one of the topmost who is remembered for and he would be remembered forever because his basic con contribution was that these variations arise from one particular organism and this organism builds up small variations over a period of time and these variations when they accumulate then make that gain in reproductive advantage that means that organism which is locally adapted will multiply more efficiently with the result that colonizes the area that is given and the others would go into either uh, lesser important stage or in, even into oblivion now this understanding built up one thing what really if variations are there what is it that picks up certain variations to have advantage uh, immediately they invoked the principle of natural selection for example if there is an organism in a given environment and that is advantageous to it then nature natural selection will prefer that and enable it to have reproductive advantage the gain here is in numbers it is numbers and as an organism reproduces more and more and um, progenies are derived that obviously become the, becomes the uh, colonizer now he couldn't explain at that particular point of time how these variations arose nobody knew at that time i'm talking about the 19th century either about the genetic molecule called dna deoxyribose nucleic acid or anything else which is a molecular which has a molecular structure that can dictate the inheritance nobody knew at the time so he couldn't go beyond then came 1900 there are three uh, scientists sharma corns from germany sharma from austria austria and uh, uh, the three people dis rediscovered what is called mendelian laws mendel here was a priest in a small place called brno or brn in german this he was a parish priest and he was very curious as to how the characters are inherited so he chose the so called the pea plant p e a p plant or what you call pisum sativum or in hindi they call matar this particular plant he chose there god helped him many people do not know how god helped him you see earlier there were people who wanted to do the same experiment understand if you take a plant with a yellow flowers and cross it with another one which has got a red one the first one the f1 generation as we call filial generation one may have darwin thought would be blending that the red and green or yellow would blend no mendel didn't find that first of all he was lucky i was telling you why mendel chose pea plant which is self pollinated whereas another person by name called right earlier had chosen a plant that was cross pollinated so when you have cross pollination the genetic variability goes on increasing and there is no way to follow what really happened so god helped him behind grigor mendel in having chosen that particular plant using that plant he came out with three principles one is when you cross plants with contrasting characters contrasting par par char characters the f1 or the filial generation has one character dominant over the other one so the principle of dominance then when you self it as i told you god had given him this pisum plant which was self pollinated so the segregation occurred and that he could see three dominant varieties three red would be there and one white or something like that so he was mathematically able to assess the pattern of inheritance and that became the law of deacon then when he go went on further it was possible that a plant with uh, let us say erect uh, erectoid nature erect nature with originally yellow flowers would now have red so that is recombination all these things happened now this unfortunately M mendel had um, published this paper before uh, brun society but then it was remaining dormant for about 35 years in 1900 they were discovered rediscovered the people who rediscovered and also other geneticists immediately looked at darwin's theory darwin had talked about variations but he couldn't explain where the, where these variations came from did it come from heaven or elsewhere or in the biological system is it possible and the answer was provided by mendelian work they said that this law of inheritance provides 
a method of variation. That alone was not sufficient. Now, one thing more happened. I have explained this, okay. Now, one more thing, I start, uh, start said about origin, it is a starting point. Creation is something, the universe that was created about 20 billion years or 15 to 18 billion years ago, whatever it is. Then evolution is, Darwin's attribute is that these variations occur over a period of time in small measures. So it is gradual development of species. Now, in the 19th, in the early 1902 or 1903, Yet another thing happened in uh, Austria. There, one of the scientists, De Rice, he found that these color variations in the plants and so on, he actually worked with a plant called Inothera lamarckiana, where a small flower became a very big flower, and he thought that these sudden variations, neither of the parents has these characters, but suddenly in the offspring, so a new character arises. In the garden, you can find many of the petal colors. All these are causes of mutations. Mutations are sudden heritable changes occurring in the genetic material. Why it happens, how it happens, we now know much of it, what really causes the mutation. For example, cancer is also a mutation in some way. So we know about this. Now, I don't think I should wait for this lot, lot of time. Takes a long time. Oh. I have al already explained what mutation is. It is a sudden change in the hereditary material. Then random, it is what we talk about random mutations, random variations that Mendel, uh, the, uh, Charles Darwin talked about is occurrence without a definite purpose. There is no aimless, totally aimless a change that occurs for which we don't find any cause or a, a reason. And the third thing is natural selection. All the natural selections results in survival of reproductive fitness. That is the main thing as I already explained to you. Now, Darwinism, as you know, suffered from one thing. He couldn't explain how variations came about. And that was a major problem. Whereas the 19th century, uh, the use of uh, Mendelian laws, Deverice mutation theory, all this suggested that now we know how variations occur in the genetic material. Yet, yeah. until about 1920, we didn't know. We, even by 1953, we didn't know what is the genetic material. We talk about DNA now so very frequently. It's household name, DNA. But at that particular point of time, we had no knowledge about it. It was in 1944, uh, three American scientists found that DNA, because it's a cell, I will show you, the cell will come. Uh, nobody knew what is the genetic material. All right, Mendel said that characters are inherited, but what is causing the inheritance? What is the material, genetic material? We didn't know. So at which point of time, uh, people knew one thing, that there is no blending of the F1. They also had the idea of new, the Darwinian principles as well as the mutations, and therefore they called it Darwinism becomes new, new Darwinism or modern synthesis. Further, in the 21st century, by which time we had known what is genetic material, we also know what genetic material, uh, how genetic material has codes, and these codes can transcribe for specific synthesis of proteins and so on. And also we knew how the environmental signals pass on to the genetic material, and genetic material gets altered or influenced in its expression. So we call that the latest, as of today, the extended evolutionary synthesis and so on. Now this is a cell, a yeah, living cell. All of us, most of the humans have got about 20 trillion cells, 20 trillion cells. And each cell, this is a plant cell. The plant cell here, as you know, oh God. Okay. okay, now this has got a cell wall. Now, the animal cells don't have this cell wall. That is the only difference mainly. And then, of course, the animal cells don't have chloroplast and some of the other organelles. But mainly, I would like to draw your attention to the nucleus here. And you know, it has got chromatin, and uh, the DNA is uh, packed with the other proteins and so on to become chromatin here. 
And uh, one other thing is the mitochondria on here, which is important, which is the powerhouse of a cell. How does the cell get a power, the energy? And this is the one. Now, this is the DNA structure, a double helix. And this double helix, it has got four bases. Like English language has got 26 alpha alphabets. DNA language has got four alphabets. A for adenine, the nitrogenous base, G for guanine, C for cytosine, and T for thymine. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but it has four alphabets. A combination of any three of these can send information out into the cell to pick up a particular amino acid. That is the thing. What is a protein? Protein is aggregation of, or what you call a sequential uh, arrangement of amino acids, three amino acids. So how do we know which amino acid should be there in building up a protein for um, a particular reason, particular read or out? So these are the three, uh, four bases. And um, then this is a phosphate sugar bone. And you can see here, guanine and cytosine, these three dots represent three hydrogen bonds. And these uh, uh, adenine and uh, uh, cytosine and thymine have got two hydrogen bonds. These are and what happens is when the DNA has to, you know, the tenacity of one of the fundamental principles of life is to be able to self-replicate. It has to become two, bec one becomes two, two becomes four, and so on. And this tenacity, this particular principle is uh, made possible here in the structure as these two helices unwind and the new synthetic materials are added on. Now the four letters I mentioned adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Now this can make about any three letter would make a bird, like C-A-T, cat. We know what it is, an animal. But here, C-A-T could man mean picking up a particular amino acid, alanine, and so on. And another one, glycine, another amino acid. So you have a particular combination and 64, 64 words in the genetic vocabulary. Now, Watson and Crick won the Nobel Prize for elucidating the structure of the double helix. Fine. But they couldn't explain. Where did this come from? Who put these alphabets? Why the DNA helix, double helix, has four uh, alphabets and three of them could make a word, meaningful word, in the sense an amino acid. See, this is a mystery that persists even today. As a matter of fact, Watson wrote a book, DNA Double Helix, Secret of Life. At one point of time, I happened to interact with him and I said everything about the book is fantastic except the word secret. Because your book doesn't tell me the secret of life. Life to me is entirely different than a structure. It is a structure you have elucidated, but you have not put life into it. For example, biologists would talk about at length about the fertilization either in a plant or an animal or humans. But is fertilization, what happens is to the sperm and egg fuse, all you know about it. And the zygote is formed. And then there are a series of mitotic divisions. And so then there is apoptosis process to eliminate some of them and to rebuild and to differentiate and so on. All of it we know. But what we do not know is there is something else pulsating in the newly formed zygote, that is life. Where did it come from? To that extent, I still remain in the same era as Aristotle, 2,800 years ago. I don't know where the life comes from. You know, another thing I want to tell you, there is a misconception that Darwin was, you know, very often a story is told. His wife, Emma, was a devout Catholic. So one person asked Charles Dobbin, how do you and your wife, two opposite poles, get along. Then he said, I live by reason and she by faith. But that's exactly true. Darwin also had faith. For example, this book written by Dilly, sorry. This book, he has quoted this, which I quote, which I read. Several theological assertions are central to Dar Darwin's case. Darwin believed life was originally created by a deistic, formless God who created the universe then abandoned it to the outworking of fixed natural laws ever after, unquote. You see, in physical sciences, for example, 
my good friend is an outstanding physicist they know and physical laws can be derived and these physical laws are largely uh, largely stable they don't mutate so often they don't change so often there may be some changes of course with regard to cold fusion for instance there may be some different views coming forth in life sciences no matter it's it's true that excel is consisting of chemistry and physics no doubt about it but a cell has got also something else which the chemistry and physics cannot explain and uh, so many codes and codes and codes who put the codes for example even the dna code as i mentioned earlier or the cell for example cell gets differentiated one cell becomes a brain cell neuron and doesn't divide anymore and there are epithelial cells in the stomach and so on which go on dividing then there are blood cells which again there are categories of blood cells which either uh, persist for a longer time or get uh, recycled much sooner and so on so all these things who controls them biologists do not know at least i do not know in the midst of all these things a new theory has emerged that is intelligent design intelligent design it says that there is indeed something beyond darwinism darwin or new darwinism or even the extended new darwin new darwinism which is that you are trying to account everything in terms of the basic principle of mutations and natural selection and of course you have now been able to uh, uh, redefine or explain how variations come about in the extended hypothesis no doubt about it yet the question is there are many things very complex phenomena in the biological world and darwinism or even the new darwinism or the extended new darwinism cannot explain where do these come from then the question is the intelligent designer or the people who are contributing to it in seattle i'll come to it in the end do not want to address god as the intelligent designer to them the intelligent designer is somebody different from god i do not know why they have chosen to consciously omit god from the consideration of intelligent otherwise in principle to me intelligent design and creation hardly have any difference you see the pattern of dna code we have talked about codes are designed and therefore dna ought to have been designed absolutely no doubt about it the question is the intelligent designer is not god that is the one contention in this now let me go to one of the reasons advocated by michael behe who is one of the ardent supporters of intelligent design what has he got to say you know the bacteria and others have got legs if i may say actually these are uh, cilia you see each one now these propel and the bacteria are able to move our ciliate organisms are able to move now to look at as you see under the microscope it is a very simple structure but when you dissect it go into the electron microscopic structure structural analysis it's a very complex form it has a molecular motor actually there are proteins which are operating to rotate the motor it can spin at about 100000 rpm rotations per minute and so on no no doubt it's fantastic now michael behe's argument is that such a complex structure as this cannot have arisen could not have arisen by very lethargic slow moving random process of mutations that darwin envisaged it needs to have been by a process which is much faster quicker and therefore this cannot explain this cannot explain this means what he talks about the irreducible complexity if you go to the previous one you can see the structure is a very complex one it is a it's involves a fantastic amount of um, engineering uh, there is a as you see here the filament thing and the number of things the basic structure so many are there and michael bay his argument is so many complex structures that compose a flagellum singular is flagellum could not have arisen in the matter in which it has arisen so he says that there must be an intelligent designer 
who designed this flagella. Fine. But there are other arguments about it. As we shall see, it is not just mutations alone or recombinations alone which cause the advancement of evolution. There are a number of fast processes which we have to take into account. As science develops, these are some of the things. For example, here, uh, Peter Perry Marshall, he talks about rearrangements of already existing genes can quickly form flagella using instruction already in existence. I'll come to that in a little bit. Uh, as I've already said, he wanted quicker processes and so on. Flagellum evolved from pre-existing simpler modular components took just few generations. You know, a bacterium has got about in 25 minutes, 30 minutes it divides. One becomes two, two becomes four and so on. So in few generations it could have perfected a flagellum of a complex nature, complex structure arising from simpler things and so on. That is one of the views. Now I come to talking about the chromosomes. Chromosomes, these are vehicles, you know, genes are contained on these structures. These are chromosomes, every species has a constant number of chromosomes as we know. Humans have got 46 chromosomes, and um, a sperm has half the number, 23, with a uh, Y chromosome, or, and the female has got uh, 46 chromosomes, a pair of X chromosomes, and uh, two X make a female, and XY make a male, and all that. Now, what is interesting is the technology has advanced so much that it is possible to paint the chromosomes. Otherwise, all chromosomes look alike. If every chromosome looked alike in red color, it gives up staining, you will not be able to make out number one chromosome from number four chromosome. But that stage has been overwhelmed, overcome, by painting the chromosomes with a certain technique. So this chromosome is number one, and you can see here, the part of this chromosome has come here, and this. This is what we call translocations or transpositions and so on. This is very important. So in the nucleus, the cell I showed, you can have this kind of changes going on constantly forever. And particularly when stress occurs, then these kind of rearrangements are much rapid. Now this is to illustrate. For example, if you take this, it is A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, G, H, I. Here you see what has happened. There is an inversion. A, B, C, this 1, 2, 3, D, F, and G, H. So it's a kind of a rotation. So transposition plus natural selection, that can also lead to evolution. Evolution is a much faster time than sluggish mutations which have to accumulate and natural selection has to act. Of course, natural selection acts on this as well. It is not that natural selection is uh, precluded from this. Now, here is a beautiful piece of work done by Barbara McClintock way back in 1930s and 40s. And what she did was, um, the transposition I showed earlier in the chromosome, changing the parts, now that occurs naturally within a cob, maze, pawn, what you call it. Now, the result of that kind of transposition is you have a panorama of colors, the kernel colors. Now, each one represents a certain type of, a different kind of a transposition having occurred in the nucleus of that. You see? Now, this is a random process. It's not gradual, and it can occur very fast in one generation or two. So this is again a kind of a point. This again has been created by God who uh, controls the transposition. So God cannot be eliminated from any of these statements that I'm making. I'm uh, only making that beyond Darwinism, we have known many things as science advanced. Now, for example, we know that our ancestors, primitive progenitors of the monkeys, the apes, and so on. Now, people look at it. The apes and humans have almost 90% of the genes same. Could 20% account for what it is, a ape there and we here under the Shamiana uh, humans? How is it possible? The possibility is rearrangements of the chromosomes that I showed. These chromosomes, rearrangements, for example, roughly 20% of differences between humans and primates exhibit massive rearrangements of blocks of DNA. What we saw, the DNA double helix, the whole thing changes. Now, that is one thing. Yet another way of evolution is antibiotic resistance, if you take quickly the acquire. What happens is horizontal gene transfer. So this is one bacterium having genes A, B, C, D, E, another bacterium, and this fellow requires resistance. So this is called resistance. So what happens is the gene flow. 
So this now has A, B, C, D, E plus some genes of the other bacteria. So very quickly they acquire. So this is also evolution. They are creation of a new species, which is antibiotic resistance and so on. Now, yet another way of uh, uh, conquest in evolution is symbiosis. The symbiosis is, for example, this what we call as a lichen. It is a combination of an algal part. Algae have got chloroplast. Therefore, when exposed to sun, they can synthesize their starch material, food. And fungi provide some anchorage for all this. So these two combined together becomes a new species, what we call lichen. It is a mixture, it is a combination of lichen, a uh, combination of algae and fungi, and this is symbiogenesis. The symbiogenesis also tells us a new thing. If you take Darwin's uh, natural selection, there the fundamental tenet principle is survival of the fittest. That means all the weak ones perish. In this case, no, it is not survival of the fittest. It is cooperation and survival. Two organisms which need to survive combine together. It is cooperation, not competition, not competition and elimination. <coughs> now, I showed you in the earlier cell the mitochondrion, storehouse of a eukaryotic cell. All of us in our cells have got the mitochondrion. How did it come? It didn't get created inside the cell. It came from outside, you know, for example, oh God. for example, this mitochondrion was taken up by a eukaryotic cell and progressively it sheds everything else and it becomes an integral part of the living cell. Endosymbiotic origin of mitochondrion, which we all know. Okay, this is okay. <coughs> now, I already mentioned Darwinism and symbiogenesis. One is competition and survival of the fittest, whereas it's harmony and cooperation for survival in the evolution. Now, let us go back and look at what are the various um, uh, uh, criticisms, uh, which are the negative aspects of the Darwinism as a whole we think about, talk about. Now, the evolutionary process in the, this, this is a paper from Harvard University you know the fossil studies, for example, in many cases we can go to the excavation of the fossils and fossils have got preserved uh, remains of the organisms that lived millions of years ago. And if you look at that, what they found was for a number of years, millions of years, the organism level was the same. Nothing new had come about. Then suddenly you get a burst of new species uh, arising. Where did it come from? For millions, billions of years, millions of years, the same species existed. We do not find any fossil evidence of something new has uh, new to have come up. Then suddenly we find there is a burst of these organisms. So Darwinism necessarily predicts a gradual, gradual evolution. That means you have to find intermediate, intermediate types. But in this, there are no intermediate types. There is one layer which has got all the ones that you had been seeing for about 200 million years, and suddenly you get to come up, you come across a new species, a welter of new types and so on. Where do you get it from? So this, they thought, is not supportive of Darwinism. There is something else. <coughs> so the concept is evolution one, as we call it Darwinian one, random mutations plus plus natural selection plus time is evolution one. Now in the evolution two, modern, adaptive mutations, natural selection plus time. In the adaptive mutations, I will put symbiogenesis, I will put horizontal transfer, all these things. What the purpose of them is to make the organism to become adaptive to a given niche and so on. <coughs> now, very interestingly, when we talk about codes, triplet code, CAT alanine amino acid picking up or something like that, it essentially denotes information. These molecules have information. Now what is information? Can we talk something about the information itself? Evolution is not a chemical structure. It is not energy. It is not a matter. What is it? What is information? Has it roots? It has to have roots from something that we call consciousness. Again, if you take consciousness, this consciousness is 
far beyond the scientific comprehension. You cannot explain. You see, number of theories are coming forth and so on, no doubt about it. Yet, I understand my brain, but I cannot control, I mean, I cannot understand how thoughts originate. And I'm able to speak to you. This is something that is inexplicable. Now, yet another thing is, Lamarck has come back in a big way. Lamarckism had been buried for a long time, for centuries. But today we now know that effects of an animal's environment during adolescence can be passed on to the future offspring. What it essentially means, environmental signaling. The signaling is picked up by the DNA. Again, in the recent years, we have come to know about epigenetics and so on. For example, today the world over we are talking about homosexuality, lesbianism and other things. So people started looking for genes for homosexuality, lesbianism and others. There are some, some people said, aha, I have found a gene on the Y chromosome or this chromosome, but that's not true. It has not been substantiated. What I mean by saying it is not true, it has not been established, okay? On the other hand, there are also some uh, observations of a real good scientific value, which is that as the fetus is developing in the mother's womb, the various hormones impact on that, testosterone and so on. Now these, the levels of the testosterone, the other one, control the tendency. A male uh, uh, zygote, which is destined to become a male, if it is under the influence of the other hormone, would be naturally heterosexual. It will prefer women in any grows up. On the other hand, with more of the testosterone, then he develops an affinity to his own sex, male sons. So this is a kind of a thing. So again, you understand the, the importance to genes, importance to genes has diminished some, somewhat in uh, view of the overwhelming epigenetic actions and so on. So a lot of things we don't know or we are beginning to know a little bit, but still we have a long way to go. Again, I want to in invite your attention to another amazing thing. You know, when uh, humans made a transition to domestication of animals and cultivation of crops, this crop, wheat, was already there. The early humans domesticated wheat. But how did this wheat come from? It came from goat grasses. You cannot eat it. One is called Triticum murato, another is Gelopsworth. Well. These are goat grasses. Now what happened was these two goat grasses crossed. Their chromosomal imbalance was so much that they were all sterile. Then something amazing happened. The chromosome number, as you will show in the next slide, one is the goat grass Urato, another is Igelops feltardis. Now each had 14 chromosomes. The genome of one is designated as AA, another BB. Now the hybrid was sterile because the chromosome homology was not there. Apparent. So it couldn't form the pollen grains equivalent of sperms and the egg. So it was sterile. Then something amazing happened. The chromosome number doubled and that doubled one was able to find its own homology and it became fertile. Now that one is what you use for making porridge or in South Indian upma and other things, that wheat. Then it didn't stop there. It went on further. There was yet another goat grass with a D genome. That hybridized with that. And again, the 221 form was sterile, but then chromosome doubling and it became the bread wheat or chapati making, or unleavened bread, and so on. So here, anyone can see very readily that Darwinian uh, process of mutations, random mutations, and uh, uh, selection would have taken much longer time. On the other hand, there is a shortcut. The whole chromosome doubles with all the genetic material, and doubles, and then it forms. So there are a number of, this doesn't essentially go against Darwinism. Only thing is you have to understand that Darwin lived about 200 years earlier than us and our knowledge is enhanced a great deal and we are able to interpret Darwinism with due respect to Darwin as to how things have happened much faster than he thought. Now the same thing has happened with regard to corn. Now the original teosent is a useless one. Nobody can eat a corn or maize. Now this through evolution forming intermediate now here one advantage as against uh, the wheat is you can see the intermediates still preserved. Mexico and other places have got the intermediate forms and also in our Himalayan region. Whereas this one is the modern corn 
and this is the male, what you call the tassel, and this is the cob, the female one, which you can harvest for kernels and so on. The origin of life itself is complete mystery. And so far, whatever people talk about, about life, are nothing but speculations, and speculations only. There is no scientific evidence, not even a clue. Now, I must tell you for a minute, way back about maybe 30 years ago, I gave a lecture in Berkeley, California. And I was talking about the radiation effects on cancer cells and so on. That is my field of specialization anyway. One John Maggie, an outstanding radiation chemist, uh, just after the lecture said, Pesey, I want to talk to you. Can we go to a restaurant and have lunch and talk? I agreed. They went. And the question he asked, I was least prepared for. He said, you come from India, where there is, you know, where we know about Vedas and so on and so on and so forth. Can you tell me what is life? Because in your slides, I had shown the cancer cells not dying, but only losing their reproductive ability. One cell doesn't become two. That is to a cancer biologist enough. If a cell doesn't become two, it is good enough to be dead. So I said, my God, if you have brought me for lunch to ask me this question, you should be thoroughly disappointed. I come from India, but I am not one of those scholars. I was absolutely totally mundane, and I do not know how, what life is. Then, to my amazement, he started telling me about life, a lot of things, and so on, including what a gentleman told, talked about a few minutes ago about reincarnation and so on. So what is life? What is reincarnation? The body is, as I said, buried with all its 20 trillion cells. Each cell has got so many macromolecules. Each macromolecule has got thousands of micro, uh, micromolecules. And each micromolecule has got so many atoms. And atoms have got their own substructures, protons, electrons, new, neutrons, and so on. And again, my friend would explain how an electron can be subdivided into quarks and so on and so forth. So endless, amazing, the specter of the God's creation or intelligent designer's creation, whatever it is. You see, you have plethora of things we don't understand. We take it for granted. The easiest thing is many times we explain away things rather than being able to explain because we can't explain. Now I want to tell you, it is, there is a, sometimes a wrong notion, notion that scientists are not uh, uh, God-fearing and also have faith in God. It's not true. For example, Copernicus, astronomer, said, endeavor to seek truth in all things to the extent permitted to human reason by God. That means God doesn't allow you to know everything. And that is true even today in 2019. It's going to be tomorrow. It's true. We don't know. Then Isaac Newton, he said, perfection of God's work done with the greatest simplicity. He is the God of order, not of confusion. Max Planck, Nobel laureate in quantum. Both religion and science require a belief in God. For believers, God is in the beginning, and, phys and physicists, he is at the end of all considerations. When they don't, don't know, they say, oh God, God particle. Von Heisenberg, again a Nobel laureate, said, the first gulp from the glass of natural, not gulp of wine or something, natural sciences, will turn you into an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, you begin to see the God. Stephen Hawking, who recently died. God created the integers. That explains everything. God created the integers. Philip said, God, in the age of science, the critique of religious reason, New York, Oxford Press, Francis Collins, it was also to the genome project. Language of God, the scientist presents evidence for belief, New York, in this. The God of the Bible is also the God of the genome, human genome. That's true, because we don't know where the codes came from. We don't know, as yet. When all these things are going on, my friend Dr. Pinavas introduced to me the kind of uh, research that is going on in Discovery Institute in Seattle. We are the functional hub for scientists, educators, and inquiring minds who think that nature supplies compelling evidence of intelligent design. Over 1,000 PhDs from around the world have signed up to support the statement, quote, we are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for the Darwinian 
theory should be encouraged. Now, today, we are in what we call Anthropocene. You know, the Earth has been going through a cycle of 100,000 years of cooling intermittently with 10,000 years of warming. The last warming was about 10,000 years, 11,000 years ago, and the geological epoch, they call it and, uh, Holocene, Holocene. Now, a Nobel laureate, uh, Paul Curson, found that next cooling season, cooling cycle should have begun, but it has not begun. Instead, we are going on warming. The Earth is going on warming. So what has happened? These human beings have changed the destiny of the planet Earth and this entire system. With the result that today we have a new epoch, geological epoch, that is warming, warming, warming without cooling. Where is it going to lead to? We do not know. Yet another thing that happened is we have been building, destroying the nature, forests, everything, and uh, where the natural forest stood, today we have converted into uh, concrete jungles and so on. Another thing that has happened, you know, harbor and, you know, uh, way back, in the 18th, uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, one uh, uh, Liebig, he uh, found out that nitrates, if applied to plants, can take up the nitrogen from the nitrates and grow much faster and yield more. So the question was, how do we produce nitrates? The solution was provided by Haber and Bosch, both won Nobel Prize. What they did was to combine hydrogen and nitrogen at high temperatures and also at high pressures. Now, ammonia was formed. It is very easy. You can use it for either uh, making bombs or for fertilizing the plants, whatever you can do. But what people didn't know at the time, but now we are beginning to worry about it, is that atmospheric nitrogen is converted rapidly into nitrates. And the nitrates are saturating the both aquifers and the soil. Now, how do we, this also is emitting the uh, greenhouse gases, another thing. But the point is that we have vitiated the cycle at one point of time, before Haber and Bosch uh, invented this method, what was happening in nature was one kind of bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria will take the nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it as nitrates. Yet, immediately soon afterwards, another set of bacteria acting opposite way, in an opposite way, would convert this excess nitrates into nitrogen and send it back. So we had a balance between the atmospheric nitrogen and the soil aquifer nitrates. Today that has been vitiated, completely changed. We are accumulating more and more nitrates and depleting the atmospheric. Why will it lead to? One doesn't know. Climate change, tipping point. Now you know, for example, uh, as Nature once wrote a beautiful editorial. It said, the climate science and the science of climate politics and the politics of climate science occupy two parallel worlds. No one is ever going to yield and no one is ever going to uh, do anything to mitigate and to reduce the uh, release of carbon in the atmosphere. So much as it's going on, we are going to go into a tipping point. Tipping point is, for example, you know, the known, um, the life is adapted today for certain sequences, like for example, in India, in this part of the kind of world, in South India, in Tamil Nadu, would they expect a northeast monsoon to set in sometime by October, November, and to end by this time. We have not had this this year. But what will happen after the tipping point, there won't be a southwest monsoon or a northeast monsoon. There will be so many bizarre things happening. New kinds of pests will arise, new kinds of diseases, pathogens will arise. So we have no clue how the world would be the planet would be, how the humanity would face all the changes, drastic changes. That is the tipping point. Today, after the globalization of the world, material goals fill the hearts, spiritual values get a lip service. Fin finite natural resources are getting, for example, in our country also, our prime minister says rapid growth, growth, growth. I wonder how the growth can take place when there is the finite resources are there. It is a question of time before we uh, for example, water is already a, a, a rare commodity, getting rarer and rarer. Similarly, all the other resources will also be uh, gone. In fact, what I'm saying is not new. Way back in 1972, the Daniela uh, 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 and others produced a paper called Limits to Growth. What they meant was that 
the earth's resources are not unlimited they are all limited and if you don't manage it very carefully we will also increase intergenerational gap for example when i was a young fellow growing in delhi i could go and drink water from any of the things and cycle up to my sports ground today i can't do that you have to buy a bottle of water that is the scarcity now this kind of shock future shock is impending so we don't know where it is going to go in terms of darwinian evolution and other things we need to take into account that evolution that we have been knowing would for drastically change when things of this kind occur and now take for example artificial the banks you go they say that there are a lot of people unemployed out outside but in the bank you say you go and press this and get that passbook entry done here with another gadgets and so on but then what is happening is no employment and other things these are all happening now the planet earth at the crossroads no more what we need is need of the hour is more spiritual than merity material orientation no manipulation of answer uh, uh, ancient conserved genome for example in china they say that they have uh, uh, engineered a baby using crispr technology now the question is i don't know whether it is right or wrong you can make 1000 copies of a violent uh, dictator you can have more and more of uh, anybody like saddam hussein or whatever so if that is going to happen what is going to happen to the planet more manual than automation jobs and others more natural forests than concrete jungles thank you friends i'm sure you'll agree with me that professor keshavan has made an attempt to try to explain to us the the complexities in living systems and open the door for us to to keep an eye open to to understand what is going on in nature and that darwin's theory needs to be further researched and uh, that's 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 the message he has conveyed we are all surprised that for a scientist he has really brought in the the other the unknown into all these processes which of course as theosophists most of us have been suspecting so before i leave the podium uh, it's my present duty to offer him a few guests uh, gifts sorry it's a heavy packages but it's a great pleasure on behalf of the theosophical society and thank you very much thank you very much Thank you. Thank you. The session is closed.